Just the two two updates is uh, the same ones from last night that that didn't look good. Uh, obviously, aren't going to be good between Cushenberry and um, and Diggs. Um, those guys will miss significant time, likely, very very likely to head to IR um, when we make those moves. So uh, disappointed for them. Uh, that's a, that's a bummer. Those guys are really doing a nice job playing for us. So uh, that that's uh, disappointing uh, for them and for us. So that's likely to be the case and the outcome here. Um, other than that, you know, just going to be the same. A lot of the same this week as it was last week. We got guys that are that are fighting. Um, we got some things uh, that take some time. Uh, we'll probably have a bunch of guys uh, off to manage practice, and we'll have guys missing practice, and we'll have a, a lengthy injury report, I'm sure, uh, throughout the course of the week, and then we'll get to Sunday and see where we're at. So um, there'll be a bunch of names listed, and some guys resting, some guys banged up. So just anticipate that from an injury report standpoint. Um, and then a couple of things, just like to point out uh, again from last night, just the unbelievable performance by Tony Pollard. Um, even after watching it, it's even more impressive after watching it. Some of the cuts that he made, the physicality he ran with, uh, really awesome performance. Um, Monty Hooker, you know, again, same situation, didn't practice much, really showed up, you know, with two turnovers were huge, wanted to seal the game. Um, that part was really cool to see and, and have him come alive for us. That was That was great. Um, and then the guys that stepped up in the midst of injury, I thought Corey Levin uh, really had a nice game uh, overall, uh, stepping in at center. Got to get some of the snaps corralled a bit. But other than that, I thought he really stepped in and did a nice job. Um, and then Dan Brunskill playing for Raidens at the right guard. You know, I thought he had a nice game. So uh, there were some guys that, that stepped up and had really nice performances. Uh, Mike Brown as well. Uh, when he had to go in there for Quandre, he did some really nice things. So it was just, it was just good to see guys step up and play well and um, uh, went, went, do the most uh, with their opportunities. So. What are your center options now? Would you stick with Corey or? Well, well, back? I mean, if, if if Raiden's is is healthy and good to go, Brunskill moves to center. Raiden's plays right guard, and and Corey's our our in our swing. Um, obviously, if Raiden's is isn't good to go, then then we'll have Corey at center and and um, Danny at right guard. So that'll be a kind of a moving process. We'll obviously need some reinforcement somewhere, whether it's a practice squad call up or a, a signing. We'll have we'll be looking for those spots um, over the course of the early part of the week here. And see what that looks like, but um, yeah, that, that's a that would be some moving pieces as we get back from injury. I guess Sears is he? Did he have any kind of a setback, or is it just taking time with him? And if he is back, I mean, would you like to reduce Tony's workload a little bit? Uh, I would. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, Tony's carrying the ball a lot, um, you know, and he's it's it's uh, you see it it wear it's wearing on him at this point, and, and we'd like to. Uh, get Tajay back to help that and, and let those guys rotate more. Uh, I wouldn't say he had a setback. It's just the nature of, of hamstrings where you, you try to open and try to go and then you feel it and it doesn't feel as good the next day. And it's just kind of an up and down thing with soft tissue and um, hopeful that, you know, we have a chance to see him again this week. But, you know, I was kind of I was hopeful last week and all that. So I'll refrain from being hopeful at that at this stage and we'll just see where he comes out at the end of the week. But uh, I would definitely like to get him get him going and get him back rolling. The first illegal formation penalty on special teams, you guys disagreed with. Yeah. The second one. Oh, no, Justin left early. No, the three that you've had. Yeah. Um, well, the first one, I mean, the first one, just because I'm, I'm tired of hearing about it, but the first one, the league came back and said they shouldn't have called it. So I know I'm not supposed to say that, but, uh, you know, that wasn't a penalty. It shouldn't have been called. The second one, Justin left early in the game. Uh, I don't really have an explanation for why. Uh, he shouldn't have. Uh, he didn't do it in practice. Um, yeah, he just left early on the kick, so that that's a penalty, and they should call it, and we shouldn't do that. What was the other one there, Paul? Sorry. I don't know. I thought there were three of them. Uh, the, the one on the sideline? The in the game or just over the course of the season on kickoff? I uh, can't remember what the, the other Kinsey one would have been. Kinsey last one. Yeah. Detroit. Kinsey and Detroit. Oh, I mean, yeah, it's the same. It's Nothing changed. It was the same. I don't. I don't. That should have been a penalty either. You know. Um, How are you drawing the line, Shaw, where they're they're calling illegal formation penalties against you when they're nowhere else in the league? It seems. Yeah, I, I don't know, Paul. To be honest with you, I'd like to talk to Perry about it. To be honest, um, but yeah, it's 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 irritating. It's annoying. Uh, and, and again, Justin's was clearly a penalty. The other two, not. So that part's irritating for us. And uh, I can't. I don't have an answer for you on why why they get called and why they don't. You concerned at all about Jaquan Jackson putting the ball on the ground? Yeah, absolutely. On returns. Yeah. And what other options do you have there if you decide that he needs a break from it? Um, 
you know, we don't have a ton of them. You know, most people most people don't have a ton. You know, Tyler Tyler Boy's returned, um, uh, Mason Kinsey's returned, but you know, Jaquan's done some good things, but the ball on the ground is is not one of them. Um, he also tends to, you know, little guys like him, those smaller returners, tend to find ways to avoid some of the hits, and for some reason, he takes a lot of them. I mean, he takes some big hits, um, which you know that happens on in the return game, but you know, the the ball can't come out, and and he knows that, so. Um, that's got to get corrected. Uh, we can't have the ball out on, on returns at any point, and he's got to just do a better job of hanging out of the football. You talk us through that sequence before halftime yeah. after the penalty. Was was Mason just kind of instructed to throw the ball out of bounds there? Kind of no, we had we kind of had. So this is I'll just take you through the whole thing, just so and if you have more questions, I can answer them too. But uh, we get the run, we run the ball in the field goal range. The intent was to get ourselves in inside of the thirty-five, you know, just to make sure, ensure we had to kick them and get the hold. It packs us up, um, and then we have the injury, which then takes away a timeout. Um, so now we're in a down, down clock situation where we either complete the ball in bounds and we're and we're clocking it fast. We have no timeouts, or we're trying to get out of bounds. Um, the first after that injury timeout gets taken away, lose the timeout, trying to get a play call in um, that's a, a kind of situationally specific. Uh, get it halfway in, and the th the mic goes out, and Mason can't finish it. And so then it's like, then now we take delayed delay a game, so now it looks really bad, but it, it's just one of those things that happens sometimes. Um, so then now we're in with no timeouts and, and the time on the clock, we're in a, trying to get out of bounds. We have to get a ball to the sideline. So the first one we call, uh, we call a boundary play to the sideline. They play a sideline defense. Might have had a chance to hit Ridley, might not. It would have been an aggressive throw. Uh, so Mason throws the ball away. I mean, we were trying to get out of bounds in that particular case. Um, those are hard plays to get off when they're playing a defense designed to keep you from getting out of bounds. Um, so that goes out of bounds. And then with three seconds left, um, I think there were three seconds left, and we could have thrown a Hail Mary, run about the 50. And at the half, I just wasn't I wasn't in a place where I was like, I just want to throw the ball down at the end zone. I've seen those go really badly um, at the half. You know, at the end of the game is a different story, but at the half – just didn't want to put the ball in the air and risk the ball getting intercepted and run back. I mean, you're in a really vulnerable spot if that happens. And then they probably were going to pressure the Hail Mary anyway, which is uh, not ideal as well. So ultimately treated that as what we call a foul ball situation on that fourth down with three seconds left. You just throw it as high and far out of bounds as you can and the half's over, you know. And it looks bad and everybody boos and all that, but um, that was intentional. We, I wanted him to do that. You throw it as high and far out of bounds, so the clock runs out and we take to the half. Like, the half was over at that point, and a Hail Mary wouldn't have been much better. So that's why, and that's how it all sort of happened. It wasn't uh, a great – the holding was really what killed it. And then the injury timeout that took away the timeout was another thing. It just – it looked – it didn't look good, but there was reason behind some of that. So I would have liked to come out with three points, and the holding call was the one that really killed it. Regulation. Uh, if you're on offense there, wouldn't you love to be rushed three and have a chance to run around for ten seconds and, and play uh, play some offense there? There's there's two there's there's two theories that that go into that. Sometimes it's um, you know you max pressure them, uh, which is something that we've done before. Um, that sometimes allows the ball to get out quick, but you're you're now you're one on one everywhere, um, and you're playing in a, in a zero coverage element, which is again part of it. Or you you rush three and cover uh, and hope you force the quarterback. Um, you know, a new decision. Now you got bodies everywhere, and you can plaster, and and you and they do run around some. So yeah, it's it's a philosophical thing, and you go back and forth on when and where it's the right time to deploy either one of those things, uh, whether you max drop or max pressure. Um, and we decided to to max drop it, and and ultimately it, it almost worked. Um, you know, he had a lot of time back there, and we should have had him down on the ground once for sure. And then uh, we they're they're hitting they're hitting them down to the ground as the ball is getting thrown, and the guy makes a great play I mean I, I don't really have much uh, of an answer for that but it's, it's a it's it's either one you're in those spots are usually thinking uh, max pressure max coverage and then we went with the max max coverage answer it can't be kind of normal you can I mean yeah there's there's different philosophies on it but um, you know you could four man rush it and play normal coverage too there's there's sort of three options there and uh, we picked the the max coverage option at that point and uh, almost ultimately worked but then you know it just you can't have them go for what it was 11 and a half seconds. I mean, that can't happen. So um, you hope the ball gets thrown or there's enough people in coverage to make a throwing lane hard. Talked about this team in the past kind of failing to play complimentary football. Some mm -hmm. of those negative plays have tended to spiral. The team yesterday bounced back from a lot of those negative moments like that last play to then answer with the, the overtime drive. What do you feel like was different about the the sideline or just the team in general that allowed them to complement each other well? 
Yeah, that's that is a good question. I I've I've been waiting to feel that you know sort of all season long, and, and we haven't done a very good job. Um, that was the first time you know this season where I haven't felt like it was like oh no you know here here comes the negative stuff. Like our guys finally got to the point where it was like no we got you we got you. I got you we'll we'll make the play here. Hey, offense didn't do great. Defense went and stepped up. Defense gives up a touchdown. We go answer with a touchdown drive. It just we we complement each other well. Our guys are, are playing for each other. They're playing together. Um, that was the most sort of connected I felt our team in the, in the course of the early part of the season. And it's one of the things we talk about all the time. And um, to see that that turn in, in that game in that moment was was I think important for us. And um, they did a really nice job of of not ever flinching when when things went bad for. And that was uh, something we've been trying to get over for a while. And, and hopefully this is the. The first, the first time ends up being, you know, the one of one of many when we need it. So uh, it was really positive and encouraging to, to see that happen. How do you think winning a game like that can be? To have those answers to win a game in overtime like that, do you think that has much carryover into this week? Oh yeah, I think it does. I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's one of those things you can't quantify in sports, but there's a momentum factor to it. There's a, a confidence that gets built. You know, when every time that you overcome something, you, you build some more confidence that you're in, in a spot and capable to do it again. And that part of it was really encouraging, and the hope is that that carries you into the – now when you're in the same spot again, we should feel the same. We know we're capable of, of climbing out of a hole and complimenting each other when we need to and picking each other up when one side of the uh, – or one phase of the game isn't playing uh, as well at certain spots, and we know we're capable of, of answering. So um, I think it's confident – it builds confidence that when you're in that situation again, you, you're, you know how to handle it. For digs and how, how you think he did stepping in? Really nice job. Night. Yeah, really nice job. You know, had a big had a big play one on one with Hunter Henry down at the end of the game where he, he got his hand on the ball with the pass break up and um, you know Mike's Mike's been a Mike got a lot of work this week. You know, with with uh, with Hook being out for a lot of practice, so he got he got a lot of work in practice. He was prepared. Um, he knew what to do and and went out and performed well. And um, that's what we need from guys that that ultimately don't always get a lot of a lot of run. Um, with with the starting group and, and he did a really nice job of stepping in. I know you've been consistent in that when Will's healthy, you want him back in there and yep. stay in there. I'm assuming that's still your plan. Yep. Still is. is. That hasn't changed. Think this could be the week, or is it still um, TBD? I'm I'm hopeful that this is this is the week. I think uh, we'll see how he feels today. Should feel good, um, and then we'll we'll increase the workload and, and let it go and see how, see how he responds uh, throughout the week. Um, but I'm I'm hopeful that this is you know gives him a chance to go play. Has the football community become, and I'm talking coaches, players, fans, everybody, unrealistic in their expectations when it comes to interceptions with quarterbacks, where they're just everybody freaks out if they throw one? Oh, I, I don't know. Um, I just know that you know there's very few years where you look up and there's many quarterbacks that are in single-digit interceptions. I mean, they they throw them. Um, and a lot of them are out of their control. And I, I know I've said it before, too. Any, every interception sort of has its own story on how and why they occur. Um, sometimes it's decision making. Sometimes it's accuracy. Sometimes it's pressure in a pocket, forced to errant throw. Sometimes um, the ball gets tipped up in the air. You know, sometimes a defender makes a great play. And there's, there's just a lot of things that go into it. And I think that quarterbacks throw interceptions. Uh, it happens. You try to avoid it as much as possible. And, but I don't overreact to them. Um, I'd like to throw less of them than we've thrown, certainly. Um, I'm not condoning that, you know, hey, no, it's okay, just throw interceptions. But there is this element like, oh, my God, the guy threw an interception, and it's like, how could he do that? Why would he do that? And it's like, well, it's sometimes not necessarily that, that easy. But, um, yeah, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of armchair quarterbacking out there, too, I think, which is, you know, it's how it goes. How much do you, on those lines, how, how much do you preach to your defense to – less of the damage on those sorts of things because like Minnesota last night had interception in the red zone, fumble return for touchdown and still won the game by eight points. Mm -hmm. You know, that resiliency in the defense's ability to, I guess, shut that off seems to be what separates the good teams from the bad teams yeah. uh, when it comes to, you know, operating that way. That's a that's a sudden change, you know, when, when your defense – you get thrown back out there on a turnover, and you have a chance to uh, either bow up or, or or give up points. And the the good teams in the league handle sudden change as well. Um, they limit the damage. And uh, again, you, you turn you turn the ball over in plus territory, hold them to a field goal. Great job. That's exactly what you're what you're supposed to do. Um, 
that is the mark usually of a good team that complements each other is that they just they go out there, the defense goes and plays regardless of where the ball gets snapped, and um, they do a good job of, of limiting whatever damage could have come from it. Certainly, ideally, you'd love to stop them and force a punt and not get points out of it, but you turn the ball over in plus territory or in field goal range, you're sort of already giving them three points, and as long as you can keep that from getting worse, uh, you have to put yourself in a good position and, and you answer what ends up being a really uh, you know negative play offensively with a strong defensive response. And on the flip side too, is when we our defense gets a turnover, same thing we did is our defense gets that turnover in plus territory and, and we go down and we punch one in for seven points. Uh, that's how you complement and respond to the sudden changes. And that's how you uh, give yourself a chance to, to win the game uh, when you make those kind of plays. How much have you addressed or do you plan to address the deadline tomorrow with the team and just kind of what is the emotion before deadline day? Yeah, you know, I, it, it's all part of the business. The players, are they are aware, they understand, they know. Um, you know, I won't address anything unless there's something to address. You know, if we have something to address, then I will. Um, and I can't say whether or not there will be or there won't be, but I just know that, that it's part of the business. It's not a fun part of the business and, and you know, you just try to be as transparent as you can and let guys know what's happening if there is something that happens. One of the guys that said you showed us, uh, you had a slideshow, mm -hmm. the different people behind the scenes work within yeah. the building. Where did you get that idea? Is that something that you, you've done before? It is, yeah. Um, two things I did was I just, I, I really enjoy listening to teams when they win championships. I, li I really like listening to the post game interviews. Um, they're often very revealing on what they, what the team was, you know, who, who they are as, as a team. And I, I I thought the Dodgers, when a lot of the post-game interviews, especially on the field interviews of the players, just really, really cool to hear what they say about their team. And uh, a lot of the themes of what we talk about daily um, and have talked about since I've gotten here, you know, you hear them say the same things. And, and I just I just played it for them. And I let them listen to it and, and felt like, you know, there's a um, – there's a commonality in, in, in these teams that win championships, and a lot of it is is how the, the team works and how the culture works within uh, within the team and the building, and uh, I thought it was worth sharing. And one of the things that the manager of the Dodgers said that, and they're up on the stage, and, and he said there's just there's a lot of people that are a part of this that aren't here right now. And, you know, they that, that just resonated with me that, uh, you know, they have, they have people that, that clean their building, and they have people that make their food and people that take care of all these things so they can go do that. They get a chance to go play that we're about nothing but playing baseball and trying to win a championship. And um, it was something we had done in Cincinnati a bit too. And, and I actually had a, a conversation with Cheeto about it in a hallway the other day. And um, I just felt like it was at the right time for that. And obviously I think it resonated with the guys. And I just, I just said, make sure that, you know, when you walk around this building that you know that the work that all these people are doing uh, to make sure that we're putting ourselves in position to win and, you know, if you need a little bit of extra motivation or you want to play a little harder, like play for those people because they're they're investing everything they have uh, into you and to our team, and um, we kind of owe it to them as well to to use that. And so I just showed a couple of people that you know some of the guys that help clean the building and some of the people that work in the cafeteria just how much we appreciate what they do and how they do it, and hopefully it worked and guys took it to heart, and I think some of them did. What do you do for Encore this week? Yeah, I spent a lot of time thinking about my my meetings. Um, you know. It, it takes me all week, and I usually have some ideas and themes and things I want to hit. But one of the the main point of, of a lot of these meetings is that I'm 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 trying to keep showing guys what we want to look, what we want it to look like, and how we want it to look, and and what's important um, to what the character of the team is and the culture of the building. And uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about it, and I hope that they they take it to heart. It seems like uh, we're starting to embody a lot of those things that we talk about, which is really encouraging for me. A lot. I mean, we talk about Nick a lot on offense, just showing up. Jack yesterday, I think he had 14 tackles, two for a loss. And it's yeah. like, he's he's kind of like that fat penny that just shows up. Um, same type of same type of guy, you know. He just he's he's where he's supposed to be. He knows what to do. He knows how to do it, um, and and he finds ways to continue to perform. And he's put together two back to back really good games, um, which is really impressive. In same same way as Nick, they're. They're the guys that you look at on paper, and, and a lot of times you think that you know we can we can find bigger, faster, stronger, better, et cetera, but um, you, you don't take into account that they're just incredibly smart football players, um, and they know what to do, and they're they're consistent and they're reliable, and those things oftentimes are are much more important than your height, your weight, and your speed, and um, 
they keep showing up, and, and that's really cool to see those guys continue to perform. With NWI's story, were you before you got here? Uh, very limited. You know, I didn't know. I I we played against the Titans in places I've been and um, familiar, but not fully. You know, and and the more I've gotten to know him, and the more I've heard his story and the things that he's gone through, even through college. You know, just to get to get here at this level, um, it, it's he's a he's a pretty remarkable story for for what it you know what it takes to succeed in this league and and how you continue to show up and perform and be consistent. Um, it's he's a he's a great story. I mean, I, I I wish more people would talk about it. You know, outside of this building, and um, he certainly earned that over the course of his his five year career. Gibby's play, coach, make it more difficult to get Baker on the field. Oh, certainly. It's you know that's they're playing they're they're playing the same spot, and and Gibby's um, given an opportunity, and he's he's determined not to let it go. And uh, that part's been been really great to see for him. Um, but competition is good, and. Um, you know, it's hard to hard to replace a guy playing at the level he's playing right now, and um, and and you know Baker's still learning, getting used to it, getting his feet wet, and uh, again had him up on game day, but there was really you know with, with the way Gibby was playing, it, it's really difficult to take him off the field, and um, you know that's, that's a credit to Gibby more than anything else. It doesn't really say much about about Baker, it's just more that Gibby's uh, playing at a really high level.